Good morning. We're going to have a great conversation about a great man who was from the city of St. Louis and made a real big difference. Also, there's a new center in St. Louis that's going to deal with conflict resolution. Come on back. And hello, welcome to City Corner. I'm Robin Boyce, and we're going to talk today in our first segment about a really good, great man that um, a lot of people got a chance to meet named Norman Say. Norman Say was a civil rights leader and activist here in the St. Louis area. He did almost so many different kinds of things. I met Mr. Say when I was a young girl and actually sitting in our living room when he and my dad and my mom, Bill Clay Sr., uh, John Bass, and so many others, Ivory, Ivory Perry, were sitting there getting ready for a protest. Now, this little girl had no idea what was going on, but I was in involved in history and had no idea what was happening. But Mr. Say was a really great man. He just passed here recently in the St. Louis area. There will be a memorial service for him uh, sometime here in October. And we wanted to talk more about him and some of the great things that he did. Just to give you a little history on him first, he was a school teacher here. That's how I really got to know my mom. They both graduated from Harris, well, it was Stowe Teachers College, actually. And um, they really loved teaching. They really loved um, helping young people learn and, and get a chance to move forward in life. And they also understood what the community in St. Louis needed, activism and moving forward. I got a chance to see them all prepare for the Jefferson Bank protest. And that was an opportunity there to really understand that black people didn't have jobs working in banking institutions here in St. Louis. And Mr. Say, others like my parents got together and protested and made sure that that happened. Mr. Say spent some time in jail. And while he was there after that protest and he was arrested along with my dad and, and many others, he really got a chance in that three months that he was there to teach young people in the jail how to read and write. He did a lot of great things, like after the death of Martin Luther King, he got an opportunity to go ahead and make sure that St. Louis City was one of the first to recognize Dr. Martin Luther King. And this was like in the 60s, and they didn't pass the federal law until 1986 to make it a federal holiday. Then Mr. Say went on into his activism and continued very strongly, and all of a sudden, couldn't work, and he had to leave St. Louis to get work. He did with the federal government. Later on, came back, worked for the housing authority here in the city of St. Louis, and then he finally moved on to the University of Missouri-St. Louis, working with a lady that I got a chance to work with, who was chancellor at the time, Ms. Marguerite Barnett, and the uh, inclusion, and I got to get this straight, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I have here today the director and chief of the, uh, diver and she's the chief diversity officer, and that's the Office of Diversity and Equity and Inclusion, Ms. Deborah Burris, who is here from UMSL to talk with us more about Mr. Say and the Office of uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. How are you? I am great. Thank great. you so much for the invitation. Yes, I had to get you here. Um, Mr. Say, I, when I moved back to St. Louis area um, about a decade or so ago, it's almost a decade now, okay? Um, went out to UMSL just rolling around the campus just to see the changes and what was going on. I graduated there as well from there. Run into Mr. Say. And he was just as bright and as upbeat about everything that was going on in the community. And he told me about this office that he was now heading up and he was, he was operating. And he was always optimistic yes. about the possibilities of diversity and inclusion. Tell me about your experience. Yes, absolutely. Mr. Say um, became the first director of the Office of Equal Opportunity. That's how it started out. And it was an office that was created that was merged the Office of Minority Affairs that right. he headed up and the Office of Affirmative Action. So the administration at that time combined the two offices and he became the director. 
and was phenomenal in terms of the changes and the, the progress mm -hmm. that uh, he really helped UMSL make when we talk about, we call it diversity now, but back in the day it was the Office of Equal Opportunity. Right. And uh, just did some phenomenal things on our campus that continue to this day. I, I hear a lot, especially uh, after the, uh, his passing, um, there were a lot of comments that went out on social media with reference to mentees. Yes. that had an opportunity to um, be mentored by him. Yes. Tell us about how he Absolutely. approached students and what he did on the Yelsa right, campus. Right, there. right. Well, he did a lot with students, but when I think about impact, I might some of the greatest things that come to my mind was the impact in terms of representation of more diverse faculty. One of the charges that he said, number one, he recruited me. Yeah. At the time, I was working for the UM System Office in Columbia, oh, and okay. he asked me to come and be a part of the staff, and so he hired me as the assistant director in 1991, but he was in the process of building an office yes. that would make a difference on the campus. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things that I recall, uh, in addition to impact on students, which indirectly, is having faculty of color on campus and we were talking about tenure tenure track faculty so as i look back that was probably one of the most greatest impacts because when you look at having faculty in place who look like the students that they serve particularly from underrepresented groups mm -hmm. that's critical mm -hmm. because they impact the the comfort level they impact the research they impact on so many different levels so what goes on on a college campus. Mm -hmm. And so that was one, one of the big things that he was intimately involved in recruiting mm -hmm. and bringing faculty of color to the campus. Mm -hmm. And when um, Dr. Marguerite Ross Barnett yes. brought him to the campus, yes. he told me one of the things that she said to him was to bring African Americans to the UMSO campus. Mm -hmm. And so he did that in a huge he did. way. He really did. And uh, the faculty was one area, and then certainly he worked with student organizations and groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also want to speak to the fact that he was very instrumental in other areas in terms of the success and growth of women moving into leadership roles. Mm -hmm. um, we, he started the Trailblazer program, which uh, again still exists today. And you mentioned earlier uh, the establishment of the celebration of Dr. Martin Luther yes, King. Yes, most definitely. And so mm -hmm. our campus was one of the first campuses in the region to host and begin the celebration right. of mm -hmm. the Dr. Martin Luther King holiday. Mm -hmm. And so and that continues today. I remember so the first one was in J.C. Penney Hall. Yes, it was I in J.C. Penney. And yes. we've all grown the J.C. Penney. We're in the yeah. Tim Hill now. Yes. And so yes. that that's a part of his legacy that continues mm -hmm. to be an integral part of UMSL today. His legacy is all over the place. Absolutely. I mean, it, looking at the Urban League, for example, when I'd go there for meetings um, for uh, for a job that I'm working with right now uh, on a monthly basis. There will be meetings there. Mr. Say's office is right across Absolutely. from the conference room. In Absolutely. fact, I believe they named that, that office after him. And he would be there all the time, Absolutely. working with the uh, working with the uh, people. We've got some pictures up right now of him constantly you know, working with people. He would um, listen. Yes. He was a great listener. Yes. And he would peek into some of the meetings and sometimes to see what was going on and he would be with approval of yes. what he liked hearing. Or he would sometimes just come on in and sit down and give his opinion Absolutely. about how he felt what we were working on, yes. which we really appreciated. He headed up the Federation of Black Units, yeah, the, uh, the uh, Federation of Black Units yes. there, which yes. was really awesome for yeah. um, an uh, so for someone to get the vision. Absolutely. And, and the importance of having community and having and neighborhoods. You, you, you and said one of the core tenets of his character and his nature was the concern for the beloved community. Yeah. Absolutely. So you speak about the Urban League, yes. uh, the NAACP. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also one of the things that we used to tease him about. He was always present at the uh, police board meetings. Yes. He was intimately <laughs> involved in staying on top yes. of what was going on yes. with the local law enforcement agency. That was his second passion, because we used to tease him about that all the time, because yes. he would leave and he would to intentionally, he would not miss a police board meeting because yes. he wanted to be there to hear what was going on mm -hmm. and to provide input mm -hmm. about the impact. And as we look at what's going on with policing today, exactly. he was intimately a part of helping to 
help our mm -hmm. police areas progress. Yes. And we have a criminology criminal justice program that he was very much connected with as well in terms of... At the, at the university? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. That was another one of the areas that was near and dear to his heart. Exactly. Policing and community, absolutely Most community. definitely. He made a huge, huge difference here in the St. Louis area when it came to to uh, making a marked difference in yes. people's lives. Yes. What's going on with the office now at UMSO and well, how are things continuing exactly. with that vision that exactly. he had? Exactly. Many of the things that programs that he began uh, back when we were the Office of Equal Opportunity have morphed in terms of uh, being more popular now under the context of diversity, mm -hmm. diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, We've shifted more from the compliance piece because we were very heavily involved in a lot of the compliance components in terms of handling discrimination complaints and the affirmative action plan. Some of that work has shifted to the Human Resources Office, okay. but we still have the component in terms of uh, diversity, in terms of training. Uh, many of the programs that Mr. Say began in terms of training around sexual harassment, yes. training around uh, raising more awareness. Back in those days, it, it wasn't was like called before his time diversity. And, and in so yes, many ways, we, we with did reference so many to training to, programs yeah. in terms of raising awareness about mm -hmm. different cultural backgrounds and helping people to bridge the gap mm -hmm. to gain a better understanding of one another. One of the yes. programs I never forget was called Face to Face. And that was a yes. program that was like a theater presentation. Because yes. the arts was another one of yes. his loves. He loved yes. the arts. Mm -hmm. And so he utilized the arts in helping people to better understand different perspectives and different backgrounds. Uh, sexual harassment, uh, Americans with disabilities. Mm -hmm. When that was passed, and then organizations had to develop an implementation plan. That's right. He developed the first plan for UMSL to make sure that individuals with disabilities had more access. In fact, and we he had a sensitive. huge activity once while I was still a student out there where um, you could choose to decide which kind of disability yes. you would encompass that day, and I did a wheelchair. Yes. And wow, finding out that whole campus yes. and the lack of accessibility for disabled people. Yeah. yeah. I, I've got to have you back on the show absolutely. to talk more about it. We're running yeah. out of time. And, you know, it goes so quick. Yes. But that's okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Thank Burris, you. For Thank coming you. on the show and talking Thank about you. Norman Say. Um, he was a great man, and uh, he was someone that um, really was ahead of his time. He understood what cross cultural engagement yes. meant. I'm Robin Boyce, and we'll be right back with more information here on City Corner. Have you seen that piece, piece on the Tiffany Neighborhood on STL TV? No. Let me show you. My wife and I were looking for homes. We lived in the city all of her life, and there's just a, a different energy when you're in, in the city. Keep up with what's happening in your neighborhood. Watch STL TV. Be in the know. because it's free, there's a train, a carousel, opportunities to make new friends, and plenty of fun learning experiences with the animals 363 days a year. So come and experience St. Louis.
Hi, I'm Robin Boyce, and welcome back to City Corner. In the studios with me right now are Ms. Jane Davis, who is chair of Conflict Resolution Center here in St. Louis, and also with her is a board member, Ms. Joanne Williams, who is also one of those folks who's in there for the good fight, like Mr. Norman say. <laughs> did back in the day. Miss Williams is one of those folks that you will see making sure people are getting what they need to get when it comes to their civil rights, whether it's employment, whether it's harassment, whatever. I would see her down at City Hall making things happen for people. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for this new center. Tell us more about that. This is brand new. Uh, this came across my desk the other day called the Conflict Resolution Center for the City of St. Louis. Tell us more about this, please. Well, thank you first for having us, Robin. I really appreciate the opportunity to tell the citizens about the service that we provide. Yes. Uh, I, myself, and several board members, including Jane here, yes. were members of another mediation uh, organization several years ago. And in 2017, Dr. John Doggett thought it was a great idea to bring those services to the city of St. Louis. And so Dr. Doggett then became an advocate and advocated to the Board of Aldermen to enact an ordinance that would allow us to establish this conflict resolution center to resolve and provide free mediation to mm -hmm. all city employees as well as the citizens of St. Louis. And the reason that he thought it was important and the reason that we volunteer our services, we are an entirely volunteer board, is that we believe that it is a opportunity to provide uh, de-escalations of some tensions and some problems in neighborhoods. We've all seen the escalations of, of uh, stressful situations, conflicts, uh, disputes in our communities, mm -hmm. in the country as, as a whole. And so it was our opportunity to provide some small uh, way of allowing students, uh, sorry, employees, uh, police, mm -hmm. citizens to come together and facilitate a discussion to mediate any conflicts and offer resolutions to those problems. This is interesting. Um, Jane, um, is this something that you had in mind that the city really needed? Uh, when I saw it, I thought it was only for employees, but this is for the community as well? Correct, it's neighbor to neighbor. Um, we also do family disputes and um, mm. citizen police is one of the big ones that's more recent and probably about two years we've been doing citizen police, police mediations. Mm -hmm. um, when a citizen has felt disrespected or has had a stressful situation with a policeman, um, the, the uh, citizen can report it to us, sometimes more officially, but um, we've, we've done quite a number of citizen police mediations wow. uh, where the citizen and the policeman are in the same room um, having a conversation Often it's more the citizen talking more and okay. explaining what went awry for them so that they, so that the policeman is not in a stressful moment and can listen respectfully to the citizen. Does that and police officer have a representative there as well or? Not no. the ones I've been involved okay. in. They're, they come voluntarily as well okay. and, um, and listen respectfully. And I've been in several where there's been an apology Sometimes it's a little veiled, but, okay. but there has been a recognition that uh, something could have been done better uh, to treat the citizen more respectfully. Okay, because that's really what it's all about, is respecting spaces and lanes and Correct. making sure and folks also to communicating. The, 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 the instance of the mediation is a training or an educational experience, too, that may educate the policeman in a way that they hadn't realized uh, how it was affecting the right. citizen. Right. Sometimes people don't really realize what it is that they, uh, how they come off Correct. to an individual. Exactly. A lot of times, I've it, just my experience over the years as a communicator and as a journalist, um, there's this perception that people have that says, "Oh, you're you're so and so and so and so." No, that's not what I am. What mm -hmm. what folks I think forget to do is kind of pump the brakes sit down, get to know that person and, and work with cross-culturally engaging an individual rather than just assuming, oh, they're riding down the street, the music's up loud, they have a hood on, they're a problem. You know, I mean, so this sounds like an office that is trying to really alleviate some of those issues and problems or bring things to the forefront then? Is that what you're doing? Well, we facilitate the opportunity to discuss this. As you said, we're walking down and we make assumptions about people all the time. Right. But 
a lot of the problem that we found is that people don't listen to each other. And okay. so it, it, it slows the, the, the situation down where one party has to say what was on their mind and what was problem, problematic in the situation for them and the other side has to listen. Mm -hmm. it, it, it requires that they participate respectfully, that this is a non-confrontational uh, situation. You, you mentioned representation. Since it's not, this is not a, a, an adversarial type of setting, sure. there is no representation by any party. It's not mm -hmm. a legal proceeding. This is is a totally voluntary. So no procedure. attorneys are involved no or anything attorneys. like in that. Fact, okay. He, okay. All the public is informed that we will not engage in any legal activity. So even if an individual, upon completion of mediation, wanted to file a suit or something, that would we pay no role in that. And they have to sign an agreement mm -hmm. that says that they are aware of that. So this is a situation where citizens can go into without feeling the need to either be represented by an attorney or okay. that whatever they say at the table will be taken into a legal setting mm. because we do not provide any uh, information. Everything is confidential. None of the, ci okay. the city does not get anything except that the mediation has been successfully mediated. And so everybody can come in, police officers, citizens, employees, and know that what's stated in those meetings or remain in those meetings. Now, how is this set up through the city of St. Louis? Because you, you mentioned earlier that um, Mr. Uh, uh, Reverend Doggett helped lobby the Board of Aldermen, and, and it was years ago, but it's now set up through the city of St. Louis? Well, the ordinance was passed in 2017. Uh, the contract was allocated in 2018. We received a first-year contract starting September 2018. We then sat down with the Department of Personnel and worked out a process which to handle the grievance procedure. So we modified Administrative Regulation 51, which is the current grievance procedure for the mm -hmm. employees, to include the fact that this can be handled in a similar way, the same things that are not covered by uh, 51. 51 is not covered under the mediation either. Gotcha. Uh, but we also allocate time off to participate in those meetings, the same as 51 would allow you to. Uh, then Joint Regulation uh, 5 authorizes the existence of the mediation services and mm -hmm. facilitates it with, between all of the city departments as well as the county officers. So this is not just, uh, excuse me, civil service employees who can use the services. These are also the treasurer's office, the, the recorder of deeds, the license collector's office, the sheriff's. Any of those uh, employees are also equally able to use it under the same administrative reg. Okay. And then the citizen, any citizen in the city is eligible to use it at no cost to and themselves. And then the department it comes under within the city of St. Louis governmentally? It is currently administrated by the Department of Human Services. Okay, great. So uh, this is a department that, or, or a, an action within this department that has been set up to really help people get through some tough times in being able to communicate with a boss, for example, or they've had some kind of disagreement with a coworker, for example, oh, exactly. uh, or even in the neighborhood. Um, I see a lot of that all the time with reference to lawns <laughs> nice. and sidewalks and things like that. So you actually take those kinds of issues on. You know, in my former life as a union representative, <laughs> Um, you worked hard. I, I, I you worked, worked hard, hard. But I also represented the departments, the very departments that a lot of citizens have issues with. Yes. Um, and I also understood that if you could reduce conflict as quickly as possible, you could eliminate future problems down the road. And, and, and the, the grievance procedures, don't get me wrong, as a union rep, we, we did not use it a lot because I tried to mediate right. myself as a union representative. Right. However, it was there to use. And the fact is that it, it's a process that can extend four months, though. Mm -hmm. So mediation can occur quicker. It can occur sooner. It can occur with less uh, incumbents on the department to provide supervisors and, and, and different personnel to come at the same time to a meeting. Right. This is a quicker process that we think, if utilized appropriately, could eliminate and reduce a lot of the problems that currently exist in departments and reduce the conflict, and we can do it in a quicker manner before uh, personnel could even convene well, This sounds some like it's cost-efficient, then. Very much this so. This is a cost-efficient way in, in, in solving issues within departments or situations and or also also in the community where you're slowing down some issues that could, could fire off within a neighborhood if somebody's just got an issue with somebody with reference to a bush or a tree or something you know you you're probably bringing down some some discourse in the community and with reference the to police individual to, yes to do more important things if yes. police are constantly being called for nuisance reports uh, dogs barking neighbors yes. shooting uh, loud music etc and they have repeat um, 
um, return calls to those locations, that is not a very good use of police uh, uh, resources. Yeah. So we have met with the police department in command. We have uh, conducted uh, informational meetings at all the roll calls in Central, North, and South stations to inform the police officers that our service is available, to provide them with pamphlets to use when they make these calls. Do they seem interested at Very all? Very much so. The it, first, it, the first day, the first mm -hmm. day, mm -hmm. Mary and myself made a presentation at, at the early morning roll call. By that afternoon, we had gotten a referral from some of the officers that we had given brochures to. So they also would prefer to spend their time doing the things that police officers should be doing mm -hmm. instead of mediating conflicts themselves in neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. we want them to use us more often. We want neighbors to use us more often as well. This is a volunteer organization. So the mediators are volunteers as well? That's Every right. mediator. And how do you get the training to really mediate? Because that's, that's psychology, that's sociology. How are these trained people that, that are mediating? Because well, I, I know what training. you all do. James yeah, you guys are trainers. Training and, and you have been in the, the business of making sure things are happening anyway with reference to the union work that you've done. But how could I become a mediator? For well, example? we do provide training. Jane has um, uh, is basically over our training because she's one of our most experienced mediators as well. Most of the board has been trained as mediators. Most of us have done mediations ourselves. And so training is of utmost importance, and Jane could speak more on that. Yes, training. Well, the training is um, about a 40 week, 40, not 40 week, 40 hour training okay. program. And um, well, in the past it's been held on Saturdays, but it may um, in near future be mm -hmm. a Friday and Saturday um, because we're having a little transition on that, but it's being established. Um, and so anyone could inquire about that on our website, which okay, I think very you'll good. publicize, mm -hmm. um, at, because we need people who are interested in doing it and want to give to the community in this way. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody uh, feels comfortable doing it, but with the training, um, we learn how to, uh, what, what mediation, what the goal is, what the mission is, and uh, some of the, um, as you said, the, the cultural and psychological and social um, issues that might be involved, mm -hmm. and, um, and also learn the process, because the, right. we have a specific process, right. which is a six-step process. Wow. Um, for Maybe we could mediation. have you back to talk about those six steps and actually go through a mediation on the we show. We've got to close out. You see how quick it goes? See, <laughs> we, get, we get into the meat and we have to close out. But thank you so much for coming on. Love to have you back on. Probably do a conflict resolution here We'd live. That would be really great. great for people to actually see that. Thank um, you. We really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you so much. And we want to thank you, the television audience that tunes into City Corner. Come on back next week. We've got a lot of great information here for you. See you next time. I'm Robin Boyce.